Good morning, everyone. Welcome to this rundown for global stocks and commodities for the 31st of July. And it was another big week for precious metals, uh, particularly into the finish of the week. And we also saw generally stock markets around the world uh, pretty solid and stable for um, for the whole week. Not a lot of progress in general stocks, but certainly uh, not falling either. So let's get on and have a look at, uh, at the action from last week. Um, and uh, if, if there's, you can hear a bit of noise in the background, uh, it is blowing an absolute gale here in Perth at the moment. So uh, you, might, you might pick up some uh, rattling windows and, uh, and howling winds uh, through this video. Let's look at American stocks. Uh, the S&P 500 ended up flat on the week. I think it might have been down one point, but uh, that's neither here nor there. Uh, so it raises the question, is this uh, a, a topping process? Have we had a false breakout and a top, or is this just a pause before uh, we we move higher? And uh, look, I, I have to tend to favour the second um, because we've now been broken out for several weeks and we've moved far enough for this to have really gone beyond what would be a normal false breakout. We may, in fact, get a retest. We'll have a look at that on the chart in just a minute. Uh, we may get a, a retest of the breakout. That would be a pretty normal charting pattern to occur but uh, I think the market's pretty much declared its hand and I think we've got another leg higher certainly in the American markets that's for sure. Uh, in the US market technology stocks and healthcare stocks were certainly leading the way last week and uh, they're, they're showing uh, greater strength than the rest of the market and, and that's a real positive as well plus also the small cap uh, Russell 2000 index is uh, is still moving higher as well. Uh, the US dollar dropped quite sharply, uh, particularly in the latter half of the week. Um, the yen rose when the, the Bank of Japan uh, failed to take any action, as was expected. That caused the yen to rise and the US dollar to fall. Uh, and that was um, enhanced even further <clears throat> late in the week when US economic data really came out lagging what uh, people were expecting in in several respects. Certainly, the the main GDP number was low, and uh, a number of the other economic data points really didn't meet expectations. So that caused the US dollar to drop, which then of course caused the price of gold uh, to go up. wasn't the only factor driving gold, but certainly it did help with gold rising, and uh, it also caused the Aussie dollar to uh, to go up as well. Now, the VIX remains at a very lowly 11, and uh, particularly at this time of year, one would have to expect a volatility breakout. In other words, the VIX to spike up to 18, 20, possibly even a bit higher. So um, I don't expect this calm to remain, particularly uh, at this time of year. So from my perspective, as far as the US market goes, uh, a new leg higher is confirmed. Uh, it's highly likely that that this leg, albeit volatile, uh, will last into 2017 as a minimum because that, if you look at the big picture, which we'll do in just a moment, um, it would just be um, highly unusual if this leg higher, particularly after a two-year consolidation, uh, didn't last for uh, at least another year, I would have thought. Uh, but just uh, a word of perspective, the market is now reasonably extended, it's overbought, and we're moving into the uh, two months of the year, August and September, which are the most volatile period. In other words, prices move around in the most significant manner. And on average, August and September also offer the lowest uh, return. Now, that's not doesn't mean that the market always goes down in this period, because it doesn't. But uh, August and September uh, are losing months around about 42% of the time, which is the highest of, uh, of any months over the longer term. So let's look at the US market. So we'll start with the S&P and you can see there's our, our key breakout level there after uh, more than two years of consolidation. So if we pan right back to the end of the GFC, um, there's our first leg higher. There's our second leg retracement, which is pretty normal. 
then the biggest leg of the lot, there's leg three, which extended from 2011 to 2014. So that will tend to be the, the longest and most powerful leg. You then get a sort of a bit of a, a messy washing machine, which is leg four. Again, that's pretty normal. And it's really formed up the way that you would normally expect on a long-term chart. And now we're just about to embark on the fifth leg higher. And whilst uh, I did cover a couple of weeks ago, uh, two or three different scenarios. One could be uh, a very brief and, uh, and short uh, leg five extending through to a leg five, which is you know more in keeping with what we saw with, with this first leg here, where the US market moved from 660 up to 1300. So it, it pretty much doubled. So it's possible we could see another five or 600 points uh, up from here, which puts us up into the 26, 2700 range on the S&P. That's entirely possible. And that could take a year or two to play out. Now, that's not a prediction. That's just an observation of what uh, normally unfolds. But I think the probability that we're going to get a decent run from this breakout is quite high. So that's the uh, that's the S&P on a bigger picture level. As we tighten in the view, you can see that we've moved up. There's been very little selling and we're just starting, if anything, to turn up again. So um, I don't see this as a top. It just doesn't look like a top to me. This is looking like a, just a pause in an ongoing continuation. So that's the uh, the US market. Let's look at the at the currency. So you can see the US dollar sold off sharply on Wednesday on the Bank of Japan news and then sold off even more sharply on Friday on the uh, US economic news. The impact on the Australian dollar while I'm here you can see we're still within this big picture downtrending channel, but we've moved uh, to the back towards the top of that channel again. And we've certainly been holding above uh, the middle of the channel now for quite some time. It's uh, it's really goes back to about March that uh, we've been trading in the top part of this channel. And uh, I'll come back to that point uh, shortly. And just finally, let's look at the VIX index. So we continue to languish around these extremely low levels. You can see we're, we're right at the bottom of where the markets typically are. And at this time of year, you'd have to think that the, the possibility of getting another spike, like we've seen a number of times through here, a spike up into the 20s or possibly even up into the 30s, if something nasty happens, then um, you know I think that's a realistic probability. Now, I've been tracking uh, Deutsche Bank of late, as you would know, as a bit of a proxy for the health of the European banking system. And whilst there are many worse banks than this, particularly in Italy, and there's a good chance that one of Italy's oldest banks uh, could go to the wall uh, in this upcoming week, they really are in severe trouble. Uh, you can see, let's just pan back, Deutsche Bank used to trade at $160 back in 2007. And we're now trading below the GFC lows. And even though you may not understand anything about banking uh, whatsoever, you've just got to look at a chart of one of the world's major banks and it's dropped by more than 90%. Um, then you just have to know that there is something seriously wrong uh, with that scenario. And there's there's no no real signs of life in that uh, in that bank at all. And yet global markets in general are moving higher. So the European banking system is, I think, the most serious and significant uh, near-term catalyst that we've got for a correction in the market. Turning now to Aussie stocks, um, as I said, the Aussie dollar back towards the top of the channel. And this is really just because even though our um, government bonds at 1.75 and probably going to 1.5 or even lower, in coming months. Um, and whilst they're absolute historical lows for us, they are still attractive to overseas buyers. And that's why money is still flowing into the country, even though our economy is, um, is hardly uh, in great shape and the outlook is not particularly conducive. And the RBA is desperate to get the Australian dollar lower. Um, 
I'm not sure that they've actually got a lot of tools at their disposal to uh, to influence the Australian dollar. I think we're just a we're a bit of a a cork in the ocean, and we're just getting belted around uh, by overseas forces. And there's probably not a lot that we can do about that. So Aussie stocks, uh, Aussie dollar finished at 76. Now the ASX 200 index put on another 62. I think it was up 68 last week. So another good, consistent, healthy gain. Um, but for me, the near-term risk is the crisis in European banks. And if that does really break open, then it will have an impact on all global banks. And of course, our banks make up such a significant part of our index that um, you know there will be an unavoidable impact there if the crisis does really crack open in, uh, in Europe. I'm convinced that it absolutely will at some stage, but um, I, you know, I will just go with what is. Turning now to precious metals, uh, gold was up by $28 on the week. A lot of that was on Friday night. Uh, silver back above $20, so both precious metals looking uh, extremely robust. Uh, stocks, precious metal stocks retested the breakout uh, over the last couple of weeks and then successfully pushed higher. So whilst in one sense, I'm a little disappointed. I was hoping that we would get a little bit more downside so that we could start to <clears throat> move back in with a bit more confidence. Um, the other way of looking at it is that the market failing to fall, showing such amazing resilience is uh, is really a great sign of strength. And we've just got to acknowledge it for what it is. And and there could be other reasons that for the fact that the market is uh, is failing to respond to conditions that would normally see a, a larger pullback. Stocks are again leading the way. Um, as, as you've heard me say many times, uh, precious metal stocks will lead the underlying metal prices in both directions, upwards and downwards. And, uh, and they appear now to be poised for the next advance. And that's really um, all that one can observe and, and conclude. Now, one of the reasons that I've been cautious for the last couple of months is because a very large, uh, almost historically large speculative position in the futures, gold futures market had built up um, to the long side. And that normally would unwind under almost all circumstances. There would be a sudden downdraft. Speculators who are highly leveraged would be forced to jump out and you could see a 50 or or $100 sudden plunge in the gold price, which would then, of course, drag the whole sector down. Now, that hasn't occurred this time. The overhang in the futures market uh, has lightened off a little bit, but not very much. But And I'll come back to that point because there's, there's an interesting but that goes with that. Now, the other observation that I make is that regular fund managers who would normally, um, or re regular fund managers that are not, al uh, not allowed to own physical gold, that's generally the um, part of their investing mandate that they can't own physical gold because of uh, various compliance reasons. But they can own exposure to gold via the ETF market. So that, that is GLD, is, is the world's biggest gold ETF. Uh, so they can own it that way. Um, and they can also own it in the speculative futures market. Now, typically they've not done that. Regular fund managers have not gone into the futures market. They've just gone into ETFs. But there is certainly some data now that is indicating that regular fund managers are actually participating in the futures market as well. And this could be one of the reasons why the, this overhang of speculative longs is, is, un, is not unwinding. Um, the other observation I would make is that whilst there's been um, some reduction in speculative longs, Again, normally what you would expect is there to be a buildup in the shorts. So the, the big commercial traders would start to go short the market in anticipation of this normal unwinding. Now that hasn't occurred either. So there's a lot of precedence being set here. And, um, you know, as I've been saying for many weeks, you can look at that two ways and say, well, A, it's one possibility is that it hasn't happened yet and it's still going to happen. But the other possibility is that it's such a sign of strength that it may not happen. Um, so 
you know, we're really in a in a very interesting and in a sense tricky position in the precious metals market. But look, it's you know, it's all good, it's all positive, and um, it's hard to argue that uh, that we're not just on the cusp of the next run in the uh, in the market. So let's take a look at uh, the precious metals side of things in a bit more detail. We'll look first of all at uh, the price of gold on a weekly basis. So you can see we had our initial move off the lows in December. Uh, we ran up, we did do a little retracement back to 1200. We've then advanced again, but so far failed to pull back to any sort of meaningful degree. Let's zero in on the um, on the daily chart and you can see we had quite nice moves on Wednesday and Friday, which of course mirrored what was happening in the US dollar. So a, a large part of that is currency related, I, I must concede. Let's look at silver. So we've got very, very important long-term support and resistance here at just under $20 in the silver market that extends back uh, a long, long time. And we've broken above that. We've come back, we've retested it, and now we appear to be starting to move higher again. So very positive signs there. But the most positive signs are really with the stocks. So let's look at GDX. So important resistance here at $28, which was formed. Let me just take that back a little further. So formed from these highs of March of 2014 and then several highs in the middle of 2014. So that was a key resistance level. We've got another key resistance level uh, up here at 31.20, which we've yet to overcome. Uh, but so far, we've moved above the $28 level. We've come back, we've done a retest, and now we've started to move away again. Um, so you can't argue with the pattern. Yes, we've got a lot of gaps that haven't yet filled and all those sorts of things, but the market does appear to be moving higher and we've, uh, we've closed basically at an equal uh, high point for this part of the cycle. So precious metals looking extremely positive and every possibility that we'll continue to see this, um, this move on from here. Looking at other commodities, uh, Copper was steady at uh, $2.22, so no movement there. Um, and it really just did track the currency movement. It dipped early in the week and then recovered as the US dollar fell. Uh, crude oil uh, was certainly down by a lot more than the currency for the week. Uh, so crude oil has backed off significantly from uh, the low 50s down into the very low 40s. There's the spot copper chart, no real change there. So just to wrap it all up, the overall strategic approach. There has been a, a big upsurge again in people worrying about the market breaking out and will it crash and all the rest of it. And the, the doom and gloomers that have been around for decades are out in force again. Let me just make this point really strongly because I've, you know, I have had some um, some communications with a few people outside the membership that are, you know, wringing their hands about um, about these sensationalist uh, articles and videos that are out there yet again. And I just want to make this point really strongly that if you listen to these people, you just do so at your peril um, because they've been wrong. Uh, some of them have been wrong for two decades. Now, if you look at how far markets have gone over the last two decades, if you'd list, been listening to these people all through, you know, you'd just be so far behind. It's just not funny. So um, they're, um, you know, they're, they're just potentially doing you a lot of harm. And I really can't stress strong enough. Just ignore this stuff. Most of it is just doesn't have a basis. It sounds very plausible and they and they do it quite well. That's why they're still around after two decades. They tell it, they spin a good yarn, but that's all it is. It's just a good yarn. And I really want the second obvious point that I want to make uh, is that, and I've done this many, many times over the years, crashes are so obvious in advance um, that there really is no point in being worried about the future. Um, 
the only reason that most people don't see crashes coming is because a they don't know what indicators to watch and then secondly if they are watching the indicators um, their mind doesn't actually allow them to see what is right in front of their nose um, if you can clear your mind and you watch the indicators as I do religiously, and if your mind is open to what the indicators are telling you, then crashes are, are obvious in advance and don't hold any fears for me whatsoever. So therefore, even if the doom and gloomers at some point are going to be right, you're going to see it coming months in advance. So I just don't see the point in being worried about this rubbish. For them, this is just business and notoriety. Um, and they have no regard. They present themselves as being, you know, have some sort of self-interest for your financial well-being. That's just crap. This is just business and, and a big name for themselves. So just ignore them. Trade what you see and not what you think should be. And that is the way to build wealth. Trade and invest in what is in front of you. I've got that off my chest. The likely technical path higher for markets, and this is not a prediction. I don't do predictions, but what I do is I observe and I look at what is normal and I look at what the market is telling me. And what the market is telling me is that there's a very good chance that general equities will rally into 2017, whether it's the early part of the year or the latter part of the year or possibly even into 2018. I don't know. But I, I then would expect a bigger correction. Now, that is based purely on the way this technical pattern is playing out. But I will be open to whatever the market shows us it's doing. On precious metals, um, is the correction over? Probably. Um, not definitely, uh, but probably. Um, and the most robust leg of, of the whole bull market is probably just about starting but I still believe it's imprudent to go all in just yet, so I wouldn't do that. This is an exercise in managing your exposure, not making any major moves, just kind of nudging it around. Um, and this is where uh, really strong discipline and clarity about what you're doing and treating your trading like a business is vital. Just you've got to get rid of the emotion, you've got to get rid of the second guessing, and you've just got to run this like a business. And if you do that, then I think the environment is there for you to do uh, extremely well. Now, just uh, finally, um, I'm going to be speaking at the uh, Australian Investors uh, Annual Conference on the Gold Coast from the 7th to the 10th of uh, August. Uh, so I'll be in the Gold Coast during that period. Uh, and I'm setting aside some time uh, for anyone that is on the Gold Coast or perhaps in Brisbane and, and wants to come down uh, just to sit down with you, you know, one on one. Um, I'm in, I'm completely independent. Um, I'm totally unbiased because I'm not linked to any product or any organisation. Um, I I just have the ability to you know sit down with people and talk to them about markets in general, and um, and perhaps uh, give them some insight into um, into what they may may expect. So if you'd like to do that. Uh, and you're in the area, then I obviously need to set times in advance. So just shoot me an email. There's my contact details. And um, I'd be happy to allocate a little bit of time to sit out and, uh, and have a coffee and talk to you. That's it for this week. Cheers.